everyone, good morning and uh, welcome to this panel, Impartiality, What's the Point? Now that used to be an easy question to answer for broadcasters. Impartiality was their touchstone when putting together news and current affairs programs. Now we could talk a lot about the meaning of impartiality, but broadly speaking, it meant being fair to both sides of any given issue. Now the concept of due impartiality loosened the straitjacket for program makers, allowing editorial judgments to drive their decisions and not just some kind of mathematical formula to make sure that everyone has an equal say. But things, as I'm sure you know, are changing and they're changing very fast. There are some new uh, players in the field, GB News and Talk TV. And they have a slightly different interpretation, one could say, of due impartiality. They see it in a way that lets them broadcast a different kind of current affairs discussion program. This is allowed because the regulator makes a distinction between news programs, so Channel 4 News, for example, and current affairs programs that discuss the issues and arguments that so often swirl around the news. Now, we're going to look at this issue from two different angles, well, lots of different angles, but two different sessions, uh, one with the decision makers that is coming up after this, but the next one will be with the news presenters, so the people that have to make those split-second decisions when they're live on air. Now, my panel hardly needs any introductions, but let's go for it anyway. Piers Morgan, broadcaster and journalist, executive producer and presenter of Piers Morgan Uncensored on Talk TV, and Krishnan Gurumurthy, Channel 4 News main London anchor, and of course, star of Strictly Come Dancing. Please join me on stage. Oh, and I should say that sadly, Chris Panatvala, who you can see um, was meant to be with us on the program, isn't gonna be able to be with us due to a bereavement. Okay, Chris Pierce, thank you so much for joining us. What we're gonna do is that we're gonna have some real world events that are put through some scenarios uh, that all of you can also vote on. So I'm sure you all have it, but if you don't have the RTS app, do download it because you'll be able to vote and, and join in. But let's just start with a slightly vague question, but at the heart of this. Um, what, how would you define the concept of due impartiality as presenters, Chris? Um, impartiality, due impartiality is, is not about giving equal airtime to every kind of view. It's about making an assessment of the situation and giving a sense of fairness um, to the main arguments and the main viewpoints around a thing at a time. So, it, you know, it, it, it doesn't mean you have to have every fringe view reflected, but it does mean that you have to have a broad view and you have to treat them the same way. You have to approach all of those sides with the same rigor, the same sense of toughness, um, and, uh, and give them the same respect. Piers, do you agree and do you apply due impartiality to your journalism? Uh, well, I agree, um, but I, I also think the whole concept of it in modern media is pretty anachronistic, to be honest with you. I mean, I think that I look for where pure impartiality lies on the airways, I don't really see it. Um, and, you know, let's take your hypothesis there. Let's take a pure hypothetical, given your previous speaker. Imagine, for example, members of the royal family go on Oprah Winfrey, <laughs> and they make a series of allegations, and you have presenters, and most of the presenters that day entirely support and endorse what these two royals have said about their family, and one presenter stands up courageously <laughs> and says, I think it's a pack of lies. Now, that is due impartiality, perhaps, you might argue, and yet one of those presenters is then invited to leave his job. Um, but in so, so my point being, on the face of it, that is due impartiality, except that when one person differed from the consensus, that person was invited to leave. So I think the execution of impartiality by broadcasters leaves a little to be desired. But in that it, hypothetical it example... It's worth saying that that, that is how um, GMB is regulated, that they don't have to... Ha all, their, the, all their presenters don't have to give due impartiality to each side. And to be fair, Ofcom, the regulator, five months later, ruled that I should have been able to articulate my opinion okay. uh, and said it would have been a chilling infringement on my free speech rights not to. So I do think it's complicated... And I do think that when I see people getting too purist about impartiality, I look at their output and I'm like, yeah, I'm not so sure, really. Okay, so it could be that it doesn't exist in, it, in, you know, in a perfect uh, form, but there's certainly people that try a little bit more than others. So isn't it good to have something to aspire to? 
Look, I come from a view that you should just have opinions about everything. Uh, I don't think people know how I vote politically. I don't think they can guess from my, my hosting which way I might vote um, or which party I would lean to. No, but However, I know what you think of I can the guests. Get very, I can get very, very angry about vegan sausage rolls, for example. And people may think that's insane. Sometimes the next day, I think it's insane. Uh, but I, I do believe that we, in a thriving democratic society, everybody should be entitled to have their opinions. Really, the more interesting debate for me right now is not the sort of nuance of impartiality, even though I've obviously taken part in debate about it. It's about the, what I think you and I might agree with, which is the real problem is establishing what facts are, what truth is. You know, because we're living in a fake news era where there are deliberate attempts to subvert the reality that's facing us in front of our very eyes. And that, to me, is a much bigger problem for the media than perhaps the intricacies of, of due impartiality. There is a difference, though, between vegan sausage rolls and issues that are you know, crucially being played out, you know, the so-called culture wars that we're seeing in our society. I mean, and, and I, you know, I may not know how you vote, but I know what you think at the end of every program. Well, people, talk, people, talk, about, well, people talk about culture wars. What is a culture war? Right, when you have biological males identifying as transgender, dominating and now wrecking women's sport and the integrity of women's sport, why is that positioned as some kind of culture war? That's not a culture war. And yet when you try and have those debates, either you get shot down like J.K. Rowling, or you get told you're taking part in some orchestrated, trumped up uh, culture war. Well, it's not a culture war if you're one of the women athletes who's seeing your records disintegrated by biological males. So there's got to be, again, coming back to my point, factual reality. I think is the most important starting point for all these debates. I mean, that obviously one of the most controversial issues of our time. So Krish, don't you think that's exactly the kind of issue where a news presenter, maybe not current affairs, but a news presenter should show due impartiality? Yes, but there's a fundamental difference between what I do and what Piers does. Piers does a talk show. It's current affairs. He's, he's under no obligation, as I am, to treat everybody with the same rigor. He, and he, he, he can give his, he's on an unregulated channel. Um, and he can do whatever he wants. There's a big difference between that. Well, we're not unregulated. Well, not in the same way as I am. Well, we're but, still regulated I mean, by Ofcom, but we're regulated in a different way to The expectations you. on you are We're not unregulated. You, but the expectations are different mm. on a talk show. Because to, of that current affairs... And so, like. obviously, in my position on Channel 4 News, yes, of course I have to be duly impartial on a subject like that or any subject. Um, but were I to do a talk show, then I would be under a different set of obligations. But do you ever feel constrained by the due impartiality? Rule? Well, it is a constraint. Do I feel constrained personally? No, because I signed up to do it. I think news is really important, and I think due impartiality on the news is something that huge numbers of people want. All the survey evidence shows that people want the news programmes to try and be impartial. Um, and so it's really important. Will there be moments where I go, oh, I wish I could say that? Maybe, but I mean, not really, because I signed up to this 30 years ago. Okay, fair enough. Let's go to our first scenario and see how you would react. And again, to the audience, you've got your app, you can vote. Please vote quickly, A, because it reflects, you know, how news presenters would have to think uh, on their feet, but also so that I can actually look at the result and uh, bring it into the conversation. So, the first scenario is, when considering due impartiality, should a news current affairs presenter be allowed to tweet from their own personal account that they went to a Black Lives Matters protest and took the knee? So the question's up here. Do you think that they should be able to tweet that they went to a Black Lives Matter Matters protest and took the knee? Peers, would you? Or do you think that they should? I think the question is slightly misleading because you can have news presenters and current affairs presenters and they have different regulations. I also think there's a, a distinction if you're a BBC news and current affairs presenter because you're publicly funded. And then I think there is a duty of care to be completely impartial. And I saw this uh, farcical thing with Gary Lineker, for example, where a an ex-footballer, I mean, God bless him, he's a good friend of mine, but who really cares what he has to say about political affairs? I mean, his, his followers do on Twitter, maybe. Uh, but the idea we have a huge national debate and he gets temporarily suspended and then restored and so on really seemed to me completely absurd. Uh, but if it was Clive Myrie, I understand why that is important. So I think you've got to be quite precise about what that question is because we're a current affairs network. I would have no problem if one of my colleagues <clears throat> went and did that. But if it was you know, one of the BBC News frontline presenters, I would say that would be problematic. Krish? 
I mean, I tend to agree that, it, you know, if you're in the middle of a controversy around Black Lives Matter protests, it's not sensible for a news presenter to take a side. Um, but that is not to say that you should be impartial about racism. Of course you shouldn't. Racism is one of those things like murder that it's okay to say it's bad. Um, and that's where the BBC got into a mess over Nagy murder, Chetty. Is murder bad? Um, <laughs> you know. um, so, no, I mean, I don't think it would be sensible. Should they be allowed? I mean, should they be sacked if they do it? I mean, I don't think so, but I mean, I don't think it's a very sensible thing to do if you're a news presenter. Okay, well, looking at the results, they've kind of, since you've been speaking, they've been, some people have been changing their minds a bit, but actually, overwhelmingly, 68% say that, that that would be okay. News and current affairs presenter taking the knee. <clears throat> Which shows that this audience doesn't really believe in impartiality. So... You've proven my point, thank you. Well, it, it, show, it shows that there are some things that people don't expect us to be impartial about, like murder okay. and racism. But the moment you start being selective about what you're going to be impartial about, you lose the point of impartiality, I would argue. I mean, take the Ukraine war. I have very strong views about the Ukraine war. I think it's a barbaric, illegal invasion by a monstrous regime, and I'm totally on Zelensky's side. Uh, however, I, I can say that on my program, I can say it here. You, you probably couldn't no. phrase it in quite the same way. And yet it, I bet, I don't know the answer to this, I'm just surmising, but if you took a percentage of pro-Ukrainian or supportive to Ukrainian argument coverage on Channel 4, Sky, <coughs> BBC News, CNN, all the ones professing to be completely impartial, if you did a split of pro-Ukraine, pro-Russian voices, commentary and so on, I would bet it would skew massively pro-Ukraine. If you're Russian, notwithstanding the fact I would totally disagree with them, if you're Russian, you don't look at that coverage and see impartiality. You see a clear bias. And that's my point about how difficult it is to... You can talk about impartiality, but what's the reality? The reality is, actually, all these networks... Look at CNN's coverage of Donald Trump. I worked at CNN for four years. Nobody could argue to me that their coverage of Donald Trump was anything sure, other than... but I think American networks are very different. Yeah, but, yeah, but, think. Yeah, but they, I don't think they made an effort. For two years, they <laughs> propagated this, what turned out to be an untrue story about the collusion with Russia, for example, as an activist network. Now, I was stunned because when I worked there, you couldn't do that kind of thing. But, but I don't think anyone would argue, or actually maybe some people would, but we're not saying that actually importing the American model here would necessarily be a good thing. That's why people are trying to cling on to the idea of due impartiality. Yeah, but my point is I think it's anachronistic. I don't think there's actual real impartiality. I mean, I, I, I see people talk about it, and when they get very high for losing about what we do at Talk TV or what GB News does or whatever, but I, I don't really see a problem. No, I think there should be want, a priority of views. But people want a sense of fairness. I mean, of course, impartiality is not a precise science. It's, a, it's an art and people have different judgments about what it is. But, I, you know, all the evidence I've seen from surveys is that viewers want um, broadcast journalists to at least make an attempt to be fair to the main sides. And they want, if I interview Keir Starmer, to give him as hard a time as I would Rishi Sunak. Yeah. And, you know, that is all due impartiality really is about. And so I think it's worth fighting for and trying to maintain, even though I accept it's not perfect. And I, I even agree with peers on something like Ukraine, where, you know, as an outsider looking on the way it gets covered, it's quite difficult to say it's entirely impartial. But, you know, in part that's because access to the other side is not easy. I thought Christian Amanpour at CNN got it right. She said recently that it should be truthful, not neutral. I agree with that. I think you should just be honest and truthful and straightforward. I mean, the best thing about uh, Christian is when he goes off mic. <laughs> so he interviews, when he, you know, when he's doing a very, very fair and balanced impartial interview with, say, Steve Baker, the politician, and then the moment he's off mic, he's, what a bleep. Uh, now that, that's my kind of journalism. <laughs> okay. Point taken. Chris, and I did saying? unusually censor myself there because yeah. unfortunately it was a word you couldn't use even in these civilized confines. <laughs> and he chose the, conf the conference being organized by my boss in which to raise that. Uh, so, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. I didn't, I didn't want to intrude on private grief, but just for the record, I have never called anybody that off air immediately I finished the interview. So when it comes to our relative impartiality. <laughs> okay. So, Piers, you've talked a lot about how maybe due impartiality is something that's effectively unachievable. And you are obviously a lot freer now at Talk TV than you were at Good Morning Britain. Well, no, 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 that's not true. I was right. completely free at Good Morning Britain. I was hired. I, was, I would have loved to have asked Carolyn this if I'd known she was going to be up this morning. I would have popped in myself and asked some supplementaries because uh, I was hired 
I was hired to be a deliberately provocative controversialist, right? In fact, they actually used the, they got the rights to play the music of Sympathy for the Devil for my, my comeback <laughs> intro music, yeah. uh, which I don't think was a sign that I was going to be due impartial. So, but what was interesting was for five years, I expressed very strongly held opinions about everything, and I never had an Ofcom ruling against me. And in fact, on the big one which caused me to leave, like I said, Ofcom eventually came down and agreed with me. So I, I just think, I think that one of the bigger problems is not that we are worrying about people expressing opinions, it's that people are terrified of expressing opinions. And actually what networks like Talk TV and GB News have done is they've given a voice to this, this uh, huge body of people, by the way, who genuinely feel terrified about saying things because of the cancel culture, which people pretend doesn't exist, but absolutely exists. Can I just ask a technical question? Was Good Morning Britain considered a news program or a current affairs program? It was program? considered both, I think, news and current affairs. So were you a news anchor when you were there? No, but the point was that I, I was a bit of both, but the reality was I would say, I hate vegan sausage rolls, and Susanna Reid would roll her eyes and say, I absolutely love vegan well, sausage it's... rolls. And the, and the public would vote on our votes, and it would normally be 90% in favour of my view, 10% <laughs> in, in favour of hers. And Susanna would do this little school mistress thing and she'd say to me, well, just because only 10% agree with me doesn't mean I'm wrong. I said, no, but there's a clear pattern emerging. Um, but I think that the point was it was yin and yang, different opinions, and that, I think that reflects the way society's gone, I think where social media is full of different views all the time. I mean, Piers kind of kicked the door down on the way broadcast television is regulated because Thank you, Ofcom accepted this idea that he could say whatever he wanted, but the programme could be judged duly impartial. And that is the way that they seem to approach things like LBC. And, 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 and then along comes Talk TV and GB News, and they kind of take it even further. And that's, that's the zone we're in now. But it's I, I don't actually think it goes any further than what I did on Good Morning Britain. I, I can tell you it doesn't. I don't see anything on what we do or what GB News does. They, are, they always, from what I've seen, I mean, I try not no, to watch... No, it does, because there's no balancing view for Jacob Rees-Mogg. Well, no, I try, well, actually, that's not true. I try not to watch GB News. I find it's bad for my, own, my mental health. But, uh, and, in fact, <coughs> in, hotel, in my hotel divan room this morning, I turned on BBC One and found GB News barking at me, and Angelos, I know, had got to them, <laughs> and had actually made that happen. So thank you. And I, you could but deny it. But Ofcom is now waking up, it seems, no, to yeah, GB News. My point is, when I, watch, when I watch GB News, I'm not here to defend them, but my God. Uh, uh, the opposite, but I always see different views on GB News arguing the toss with people. I see Jacob Rees-Mogg arguing with people that disagree with him. That is modern democratic society. What's the problem with that? Why is everybody well, scared Ofcom about Ofcom has a problem because just two days ago they found them in breach of due impartiality. Well, I think they that, they, that particular, before. yeah, but that's interesting. So they didn't find against us, for example, when Nadine Doris interviewed Boris Johnson probably because they re recognised that he would rather hide in a fridge than be interviewed by me, so that was as near as we could get. Uh, but they did find against GB News, I mean, you can ask Angelos himself this, but I would imagine they probably do regret having a cabinet, you know, as a chancellor, being interviewed by two conservative MPs. Clearly, you're pushing the envelope there to a point that was found unacceptable. I would agree with that. But I, do, I don't have any problem with politicians hosting shows, whether it's David Lammy on LBC or whether it's Jacob Rees-Mogg on GB News. What's the problem? The problem is only if you don't allow other voices to be heard. If you become a sort of version of Pravda, that is clearly a, a partial news coverage. I don't see any of that on our network, on GB News, or any of the others. And I think the real reason that people like Christian might be worried about it is because they know that the public actually, slowly but surely, are moving in their heads because of the plurality of opinions, particularly on social media, to a place where they want to have spirited no, debate no, with lively views. That's not the case at all. I mean, because actually, again, if you ask the public what they trust, you know, you look at the Reuters Institute survey, look at the Ofcom annual survey, the trust scores for a programme like Channel 4 News are, you know, way over 50%. The trust scores for GB News are way below. Um, and so people may want... There is a constituent of people who want that kind of news, and that's fine. Um, but I think for, you know, for the mainstream, for, for the majority of people, they want a news that they can trust. And I think it's fine to have politicians presenting news programs. Channel 4 used to get politicians to present mm. uh, politics programs at lunchtime uh, on a program called Powerhouse. Um, but you've got to have a balance. So it's fine to have Jacob Rees-Mogg, but where's the Labour equivalent? You know, LBC have done it by having, you know, they'll have David Lammy one week and a, a Tory the next week or, or, or whatever, or James O'Brien in the morning and Nick Ferrari in the breakfast. I think 
it's fine to have opinion, but you've got to try and balance it out. I mean, to get technical, one of the problems with Ofcom is when you have politician presenters that the, they end up doing the work of a more traditional news presenter in the case of breaking news. So that's technically why some of the issues against the GB News have been raised by um, Ofcom. Okay, let's go to scenario two, right? So everyone ready to vote. After the Privileges Committee found Boris Johnson deliberately misled Parliament, would you be happy to say on air, surprise, surprise, Boris Johnson found to have lied? Krish. Would you be happy to tell uh, I probably did say that. Um, I'd, um, <laughs> there you go. I mean, surprise, surprise, again, I mean, you, you couch the question with sarcasm. I don't think sarcasm is a very good look for... for news presenters on the whole. So surprise, surprise is the bit there that I would go, mm, you know. Mm. Tonally, I probably wouldn't do that. But yes, I've said politicians lie. I've said Boris Johnson found to have lied, and it's no surprise, is what I would say. I think that's fine. Piers? I would literally say those words. If I, I, think I'd, <laughs> <laughs> I, think I, I think I did say Probably those words. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no question, because I would apply sarcasm because it would be the least surprising finding of the year. So Boris Johnson is a serial liar caught lying by Parliament. Surprise, surprise. Uh, why would anyone be surprised that someone like me would say that? And why would anyone frankly take offence? I mean, I remember the ridiculous farce of Emily Maitlis uh, on Newsnight telling the truth about Dominic Cummings and then being reprimanded to the extent where she basically gave up on the BBC and went to go and speak her opinions elsewhere. But what was wrong with what she said? It was a ridiculous thing. Uh, it was a completely trumped up uh, scandal created by Downing Street complaining to the BBC. And broadcasters have to stand up to this stuff, whether it's Downing Street ringing you or some princess in Montecito. Just tell them, sorry, keep your big nose out of our affairs. Interesting, you both agree. The audience doesn't agree with you by quite a wide margin. Why do you think there's this discrepancy? Well, you've got to ask the audience, how can you, on the previous one, vote one way, and on this one, vote <laughs> this way? It shows you have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There'll be coffee after the panel if you want to put that point to, uh, to peers. Uh, okay, now, so, I mean, Piers, I guess this, well, not mainly to you, but you have experience of working in the U.S. Of course, you mm. were at CNN for a long time. Uh, you were absolutely not impartial when it came to guns. Arguably, it cost you your job, but you felt very strongly about it. So you know how the American system works. And there's a lot of talk about the possibility of the Americanization mm. of British news. Um, do you think that we run the risk of that, of the BBC being a bit more, you know, PBS-like and, and having more channels, and maybe some left-wing channels like MSNBC um, that are very opinionated? Do you think we run the risk? I just don't have a problem with it. If you don't want to watch it, don't watch it. We live in a democracy. I mean, I think the impartiality sort of rules started when television first came on were when there were like one or two networks in both countries. Now there's hundreds, thousands. Um, you can go where you want to get your news or where you want to get your opinion. I really don't see that this is the big problem. The bigger problem, like I said at the start, I think is fake news and the increasingly sophisticated ways that, that people are marshalling social media to promote and propagate fake information. I think that is far more damaging actually to democracy than these nuances about impartiality. But don't you think that one of the risks of abandoning due impartiality is the spread of misinformation? I'm not making this accusation about you or Talk TV, mm. I'm just saying in general that once you stray away from that objective, actually misinformation is exactly what you've understood. Yeah, but you see, I mean, I've, it's interesting, I mean, take Clive Meyer again, You're, oh, well, I'm a huge fan of his, that's why I'm mentioning him. I've just read his book, which is great, but it's packed full of opinions. He argues that those opinions are facts and therefore they're not opinions. But actually, I'm not so sure. For example, he said that he was ashamed of Britain over Windrush. Well, I agree with him, and I've said the same thing. But is that an impartial view? Is that a neutral view by a BBC anchor, news, head BBC news anchor, to say that Windrush made him ashamed of his country, ashamed of Britain? There might be other people that disagree with that. Now, I agree with you that there should be no division of opinion about racism, but there might be people who say, I pay my licence fee, I don't want to hear people express that kind of opinion. Interestingly, his book was put through the BBC system, and they decided that opinions like that, he has a pop at Theresa May, he's a pop at, you know, he's quite opinionated, I think. Um, if I'd written that book, you'd say, oh, it's full of opinions. Um, they put it through and decided none of that crossed a line. I'm not so sure. Chris, the, the issue, also, I'd love to know whether you think we're going to look more like the US. In a well, I, th I think we already are. But, and the, the, the issue for me is not the existence of these channels. I 
I believe in choice. I believe people should be able to watch whatever they want. That's absolutely fine. The issue is actually how people in power treat those channels. So the impact of GB News and not talk TV actually yet, but, um, but perhaps it will be on the way news is covered in Britain has been that, look at the press conference yesterday with Rishi Sunak. You get a question from ICV, a question from the BBC, then a question from, the BBC, uh, from GB News, which is a bit of a softball question, and there's no time for Channel 4 News. Now, that is the impact on public service broadcasting that I don't like, because this government uses GB News as a platform. Hang on, maybe, they, it, maybe, they've because, see, maybe they've seen the pictures of you in secret. Of course, that's fine. You're not a serious journalist. That's always possible, you know. but, but I doubt it. I don't um, see any GB News presenters marching about in a pink tutu. They will. Right. Um, <laughs> so I think the issue is actually, th is, is not that they exist, but how people in power use them. And if people in power say, well, that network is on our side, and if there's a Labour government next year, and then there's a lefty channel, and they say, well, we're going to go to Navarra Media for all our exclusive interviews, that's going to be very bad for public service broadcasting. But by the way, the Americanization thing, I, I've worked a lot in America, a lot for four years at CNN, I've done a number of years now with Fox, I really enjoy going on Fox, they never tell me to change my opinions or take any particular line, I'm not a conservative, I'm not right wing, they know that, and they have no problem with me hosting, I did, I did Tucker Carlson's uh, 8 p.m. slot for a week recently. Uh, I do The Five, which is the biggest US cable news show. I host that regularly, co-host that uh, quite regularly. And there's never any pressure on me to change my opinions or anything. Um, so, and what I do think that we could learn from America is unbelievably high production values. Whether you're at CNN or you're at Fox, incredibly high. We could definitely take some of that. I think by comparison, I think... But they don't do journalism. That's the, the, they the do trouble. do journalism. No, 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 no. That's they such don't. a pompous they thing don't. to say. No, no, no. They don't go out and film stuff. So look at the Congress, storming of the Congress. Do January they, the they don't film stuff. What do you mean? Look at January the 6th. There was only one TV crew that went into Congress and followed the protesters as they went into Congress. It was an ITV news crew. There were no American networks doing that. That's the, pro that's the difference you can't between... Really, you can't honestly accuse... That's the difference between the way Christian, they do Christian, news and the way we do You can't accuse news. CNN of not following news, for goodness sake. They've got armies of people all around the world with some of the best reports. No, but the culture the of news channels is just people sitting in studios arguing with other people no, it's just not, on remote cameras. I don't think it's you, not about going out I don't and doing original this. journalism. I think this is... I think, honestly, I think that is a myth. I, that is not what I see on these networks. They do a lot of news coverage, a lot of very brave and courageous reporting. You CNN might... is different. CNN is an outlier. Well, it's an Fox, international but news Fox train. does it's too. And by the way, on breaking track. news now, Fox beats CNN almost every time. There's a reason, right? They, Fox is number one by miles in America. People may not like it. They might have a twisted view of what it actually is, and they're certainly not faultless. But in my experience of them, they do breaking news better than anybody else. And that's why they're number one. So I think that you, you, can, you can say, look, we don't want Americanism to come here. I think there's a lot of things we could take from America which would actually enhance You'll our also get a, a narrowing of the news agenda if that happens. And I think that's already being seen here as well, which is, which is very bad. You know? Why? Why? Because you'll stop covering the world. Why? You know, as, as it is, Channel 4 you know, has a different remit to the other broadcasters, so yet we spend a little bit more time covering more remote parts of the world or stories that aren't as you know, obviously popular um, as everyone else. But once you go to, to news channels which don't have the money to go to these places and aren't going to spend the money going to these places, your news agenda just becomes narrow politics, domestic stuff. You, know, you stop covering the world. And debate. Look at what Fox cheaper. covers. You know. yeah. I, listen, I, I think, if you don't mind me saying... I don't actually care if you do. Uh, <laughs> I, I do think that's a pretty pompous statement. You know, I think that, unfortunately, that is indicative of there's a lot of that kind of attitude in the mainstream British media about the Americans. And having worked a lot in America, I think a lot of it is undeserved. Some of it is. Um, but I, look, I can enjoy Channel 4 News. I can enjoy Fox. I can enjoy CNN. I can enjoy a plurality of news. I recommend it to people. And when I go to America, the first thing I do, I watch a bit of MSNBC in the morning, Morning Joe. I watch a bit of Fox and Friends. I watch a bit of CNN. And then you get a nice rounded picture of where all the different competing voices and agendas are coming from. That's, that's actually good, good for democracy. And if you don't want to watch any of them, watch something else. The, the issue, I think, as well, I mean, and it's good that we've got him here, is, and he's talked about it incessantly, is, is the fact that the product of this is that Piers is not on ITV. And that is to be a that real is shame. That is ITV's loss. And yeah. it's, well, it's, all, <laughs> it, it's all of our lost Piers. I used to watch on ITV. Um, and, and I think we don't want to get ourselves into a situation where people like him are forced off into the fringes of the internet. 
<laughs> well, I, I, look, I don't think it is... I wouldn't say what we do is fringes of internet. <laughs> So, he took that for a while, didn't he? Yeah. I, had to, I had to really rewind and listen to what he said there. Arrogant prick. The, uh, the, we actually have, like, take on my show, Uncensored, for example, we have one and a half million YouTube subscribers to our channel now, the fastest growing of its kind in the world, and we have millions of people watching interviews with Rishi Sunak or Governor Ron DeSantis or Zelensky in Ukraine and stuff like that. We do actually go to these places. Christian doesn't watch it, uh, but if he did, you see, not only do we go, but we also get better numbers than he does. Uh, it's just in a different format. And I don't care where we get our eyeballs, and nor should anybody else in the room. You go to Ukraine, room. but you don't go to Eritrea, you don't go to any of the far-flung places. Well, I don't go to Strictly you. Come Dancing either, Sunshine, so oh. it's all relative. OK, guys, we have one minute, so if you could both just tell me if you would change regulations, how would you regulate British broadcasting? Chris, maybe you don't want to change. Oh, if I would change it? I mean, we have a fundamental choice ahead of us as to whether we think regulation is working or not. Um, and, you know, I, I, it's, not, it's, not, it's not for me to decide. I think, you know, it's... I, I don't think you can look at the current situation and go, what, we, need, we need this tweak or we need that tweak. It's a fundamental question. Do we think we need regulation or not? Do we need a set of rules or not? Do we trust broadcasters to do it the way, you know, by themselves? In America, it hasn't really worked, okay. would be my warning. So, personally, I think we need a regulated system. I think viewers want it. Piers, very quickly, please, but if you... I think we're massively regulated in this country with the media. I think the real problem is the unregulated, unlicensed wild west of the internet and the way that it promotes fake news, and that's a far bigger problem. I don't think we, need, we need more regulation here. We're regulated to our, to our eyeballs. What I would say is that perhaps at ITV, they could put the head of Ofcom in charge and then you keep people might, like me on air because they seem to understand what free speech is better than some of the people running media companies. But that's a contentious view, and I wouldn't expect you all to agree with me. And on that note, we're going to have to leave it there. Piers Morgan, Christian Guru Murthy, thank you both so much. Good fun, mate.